morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody, in YouTube or Facebook land. Glad to have y'all with us too. And before I get into the sermon, let me just say, uh, thinking about the, the COVID stuff, Corona, whatever it might be called, and, and how that's affecting everybody. Uh, the leadership, the elders and ministers here, we met this week. We looked at the, the numbers of cases in our community had, had risen, and so we made the decision to to go ahead and have service, but encourage people, if you did not feel safe coming, if you were compromised, or someone in your household there was compromised, you might not want to come. And, and I noticed that several people did decide not to come this morning who, who have been being here past weeks. And look, that's what you needed to do. We're, and we're glad that you're making that decision uh, as you needed to. Uh, but keep an eye on the numbers in our community. As the numbers in our community go back down, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to feel safe and come back to worship with us. Uh, but we are here. We are joined together as those that have come to worship the Lord. And if you weren't able to be here, you're worshiping with us online. And it's your house, wherever you might be. Uh, so we are still the body of Christ, that new chapter of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are here together to worship our Lord as we look at His Word. And I'm telling you, this morning I am excited about what we're going to look at. I, I'm excited. I'm excited every Sunday. I hope you can tell that. But especially today, as we look into God's Word, we're going to look at what is considered by many and, and what I consider to be the most astounding prophecy in the Bible. The most amazing prophecy in the Bible as I look at it. Now, there are a lot of prophecies in Scripture that we see fulfilled, have seen fulfilled, and we're looking forward to seeing it fulfilled. Um, and, and prophecy, as you look at it in Scripture, we've looked at the, the visions that Daniel was given in Daniel so far. They've been a lot of, there's been a lot of symbolism. They've been hard to understand in a lot of ways. They haven't always been perfectly clear. And for that reason, people who want to not believe Scripture and want to discredit the Bible will tell us that uh, we're making this stuff up and that we're just reading what we want to read into it. Now, the wonderful thing about the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 that we're going to read today is that God nails down details specifically. He sets a timeline for what is going to happen. He gives an exact number of years so that we can tell to the year in history, the exact year, when certain things are going to happen hundreds of years before they do happen. Now, I'll tell you from the beginning, this prophecy involves things that have already happened in our past and in Daniel's, in the Jewish people's future. And as we go through the timeline, you're going to be amazed at the accuracy we find. If you pay attention, if you pay attention to this prophecy and you don't zone out on me, you're going to understand what God said and did. And it will grow your faith and it will reassure you that God is real, He is true, and He is in control of all creation. <coughs> so turn in your Bible to John chapter 9. And if you uh, are home and, and you don't have, uh, a, 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 you, you're not going to have the notes. I would encourage you to write notes. If you're here and you don't have a copy of the notes, then, then go ahead and take a pencil and paper out. You'll be ready to take notes as well. Last week we were reading a beautiful prayer in Daniel 9. Daniel apologizing to God in that prayer for the sin of his people. Asking God to forgive the Jewish people who had sinned against him and been sent into exile. And that 70 years of exile, as Daniel read prophecy, he saw, hey, we're, we're very close to that 70 years of exile being ended. And so he's asking God to forgive the people of Israel, the Jewish people, and allow them to go back into the promised land and to have Jerusalem rebuilt. God sends the angel Gabriel with an answer to that prayer. And the words we're going to read are God's answer concerning the Jewish people the forgiveness of their sins and their restoration to the promised land. And he begins in, in Daniel 9, verse 24, 
Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Seventy weeks. What does he mean, seventy weeks? Weeks have how many days in them? Seven. Seven, okay. And, and he's saying seventy sevens. That's known as a hectad, and it's nearly universally agreed among Bible scholars and historians that each week here represents seven years. So when Daniel hears, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city, in answer to the prayer you just made about forgiveness and the, 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 being sent back to the promised land, Regal, uh, Jerusalem, and the temple, he says, 70 weeks. He's hearing 70 periods of seven years, which is how many years? 490 years. God tells Daniel, 490 years to do what I'm getting ready to do. In this vision, God is saying his plan is going to be accomplished for 490 years. 70 weeks, 490 years of hope. What is God going to do? This is God's answer to Daniel's prayer. And he gives this vision of the prophet full of hope here. Look at verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So God reveals what he's going to do over 490 years. Exactly 490 years. There are two categories here in these infinitives. There are six infinitives, two different categories. The first three are about uh, taking away sin. The second three are about uh, bringing in righteousness. God will separate his people from their sin in this 490 years. First of all, finish the transgression. What does it mean to finish the transgression? The sins of the Jewish people have not yet reached their low point. During this 490 year period, the Jewish people are going to sink even lower than they already have, and they're going to reach a point where God draws the line and says, that is the last straw. That's what's going to happen in that 490 year period. The second thing he says is he's going to make an end of sin. This means to put a seal on sin, to keep sin from spreading among the Jewish people. God will judge them for that last straw transgression that they commit. He's not going to let them continue to walk in sin after that as his people. The third thing he says is to make atonement for iniquity. You know what that's talking about, right? The atoning sacrifice for the sins of the Jewish people. God is going to make atonement for their sin. And guess what that atonement was? Jesus on the cross. So in that 490 year window, the way that God is going to atone for the sins of the Jewish people, that's what he's specifically talking about, is the death of Jesus on the cross. It's going to happen in that 490 year window. And we're going to hear in a little while exactly when in that 490 year window. Exactly when. And we also know, looking back on it, that his death not only paid for the sins of the Jewish people, but paid for his sin. Our sin. Everybody's sin. Not only will God separate his people from their sin, but those, the next three that he talks about, God will introduce his people to eternal righteousness. He will bring in everlasting righteousness. Jesus' atoning sacrifice for sin means that a person who comes to him and, and his, sin atones, his sacrifice atones for their sin, they can have everlasting or eternal righteousness. The righteousness of God through Jesus. Right? We clothe ourselves with Christ. And again, I want to just remind you, he's speaking specifically about the Jewish people from their perspective, what is going to happen? Righteousness, having a right relationship with God. Jewish people, when the atoning sacrifice is made, that is going to allow the Jewish people to have a right relationship with God through the atoning sacrifice. You with me? Okay, cool. The 
second thing he says, God will seal up vision and prophecy. Remember when Daniel's thrown into the lion's den, what does the king do? He seals the, the stone put front. He seals the stone so that that's, that is a sign. Yes, I, the king, have put Daniel in the lion's den. I have sealed the stone there in place, and nobody can change what I have done. Well, God seals up vision and prophecy during this 490 years. He put, he's going to do something that is going to put his stamp on it. I did all of this and nobody's going to change what I did. Right? The fulfillment of prophecy, the visions, they're completed, they're sealed. And finally, God will anoint the most holy place. In the temple, when the temple's rebuilt, or you remember the tabernacle when they were traveling through the wilderness, what was, what was the most holy place in the world? It was in the temple, in that inner room, the holy of holies, the most holy place, where the high priest had an opportunity to go in there once a year into the very presence of who? God. He dwelled his presence there on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. The most holy place that's going to be anointed in this 490 years, guess what, who it is? I just told you, it's a who, it's Jesus. Because just like under the old covenant, the most holy place was the only way someone could come into the presence of God, the Father. The only way anybody is ever going to come into the presence of God after Jesus is through Jesus. And Jesus, by the way, when he was baptized, what happened? The sky spit apart. A, a dove comes down and lights on him the, as in the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. And the Father says, this is my son. Jesus is anointed by the Father. These are the things God reveals through David to be his plan for 490 years. God is going, and it's, it's kind of a summary of what's going to happen. He is going to separate his people from their sin. He's going to bring his people into the opportunity here for eternal righteousness. And I'll remind you again, this is a specific prophecy about what God is going to do with the Jewish people over 490 years. The high point of all of that is going to be the coming of Jesus. And what that means for them, and as we look back on it for all of us. So what key events will be seen in the 69 weeks? We're getting ready to read about 69 weeks, by the way, is one week short of 70, and 69 weeks will be 483 years. Look at verse 25. He's going to drill down now into what's going to happen in that 70 weeks. He says, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Daniel sees this vision in 539 B.C. The countdown of 490 years doesn't start then. This decree to rebuild Jerusalem is going to be the starting point. You with me? Okay. <laughs> the prophesied exile is going to end not long after 539 in Daniel's prayer and he sees his vision. It's going to be uh, years of Jewish people migrating back to the promised land. Many years of that's going to happen. And it's going to take a long time before they start to work on rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. In verse 24, we heard 70 weeks, 490 years. Gabriel now says 69 weeks, 483 years. That's two time periods we're going to look at. Uh, seven weeks and then 62 weeks. And after we get done with that, we're going to look at the very important 70th week, the la uh, last week, or the last seven year period. All right, look at the set. Everybody confused now? All right, here we go. <laughs> Need to white more? <laughs> Keep your red white more. You got 70 weeks, right? And now he's divided it up into seven weeks 
and then 62 weeks. All right? So now he's getting specific. Discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, there's going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The seven weeks is 49 years to rebuild Jerusalem. When did that happen? Write this number down, 457 B.C. 457 B.C. There's this guy named Ezra. We read his book in the Old Testament. And Artaxerxes, King Artaxerxes, sends him back to Jerusalem. He authorizes him to go back. And when he gets back there, he spends some time... Uh, working on, you know, people had, the, the people that were left in the land had married people they shouldn't have married. The people that had come back had married foreigners they shouldn't have married. And he gets all that stuff straight. The following year, he, he went back in 458. In 457, guess what Ezra does? He leads the people in attempting to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Evidently, God told Ezra to do what? Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. That would be the, the, the year that the decree was issued to rebuild the walls. Now, Ezra didn't finish it. Uh, uh, Nehemiah would come along 16 years later, and he would uh, finish rebuilding the walls. But even then, it would be a long time. In fact, it would be 49 years from the day that Ezra started rebuilding the wall until Jerusalem would finally be completed. Seven weeks, 49 years, from the day that Ezra started, because that's when God said to start. So how many time frames are we talking about? We're talking about, first of all, seven weeks, or 49 years, and then 62 weeks, or 434 years. 434 years after the, the city was completed, who would be born? Or not who would be born, who would come? Messiah. Messiah would come. When did he come? A.D. 26. Write that number down. A.D. 26. And I'm going to tell you folks, I'm giving y'all all these numbers and y'all are looking at me scratching your head. This was a beast for me to put together because I'm not a numbers person. Keep the rattle it off just like that. <laughs> But I went back and checked the math and checked the math and checked the math because I just could not believe how accurate it is. But it is. It's true. 434 years after the city of Jerusalem was completed, according to prophecy, Messiah would be revealed. The decree to rebuild Jerusalem came in 457. 49 years later, it was completed. 434 years later, Messiah would come. A.D. 26. If you know about 957, when Ezra started the, 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 the building, you know the exact year to look for Messiah. The exact year. 26. Now, what happened in A.D. 26? Anybody want to take a guess what happened in A.D. 26? That is when Jesus was baptized. The year, A.D. 26, is when Jesus is baptized and he was anointed. The most holy was anointed because the Spirit descended in the form of a dove. And the Father said, this is my son. There he is. And Jesus begins his ministry of preaching the kingdom of God and doing all these miracles. And people see evidence that he is Messiah. And that starts him down the path. His, his baptism is when he starts down that path that's going to lead to Jerusalem where he will die for the sins of the world. Understand what you are reading and hearing. If in the year 539 B.C., God tells Daniel the exact year of Jesus' baptism. If he only knows when Ezra starts. This is an, it's undeniable that God had a plan all along and he worked that plan exactly as he did. We see what will happen in the 69 weeks, 483 years after the beginning of the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. But remember, Gabriel still has how many weeks left to talk about? One week. How long is one week? Seven years. What will happen in the 
the 70th uh, week, the final week, the final seven years. Before I read these, these last couple of verses, I want to point out there are going to be two individuals we're going to read about. One of them is going to be the Messiah. The first part of the, both of the last two verses, the first part talks about Messiah. The second part talks about a prince or a leader who will come. And, and that's a bad, bad person, okay? They're a bad person. That they think they're doing something, but actually God is using them like a, a pawn on the chess, chessboard. Look at verse 26. Then, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make, he being Messiah, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. That's the last week, right? But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And then he goes on to talk about this, this prince or this leader who will come. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. All right, let's unpack that. Messiah makes a firm covenant, but is cut off in the middle of the week. Remember the final week, the final seven years begins at Jesus' baptism. After his baptism, Jesus makes a firm covenant with the many. What does that mean? Jesus validates the covenant God made with the Jewish people all the way back at the beginning that the Messiah would come through them, that the Messiah was coming. He confirms the covenant for the Jewish people, the covenant that, that would last as he comes and forms this firm covenant for seven more years. From the date of his baptism, seven more years. But in the middle of that week, what happens? He puts an end to sacrifice. And what it says in verse 26 is that Messiah will be cut off. Three and a half. I do know this math. Half a seven is three and a half, right? What happened three and a half years after Jesus was baptized? He went on to a cross. He was put on a cross and crucified and died to pay for the sins of the world. He was cut off. And in his sacrifice of himself, he put an end to the sacrificial system of the old covenant. You got it? The moment he died on the cross, the lamb who came to take away the sin of the world, the entire system of sacrifice to roll back the punishment of sin from the old covenant was ended. Right? Three and a half years after his baptism. Now, we still have three and a half years to go until the end of the 70 weeks, the full 490 years. The firm covenant Jesus made with the Jewish people at his after his baptism <coughs> lasted for three and a half years after his death. Did anything significant happen three and a half years after Jesus' death? We're going to come back to that in a, in a, in a few minutes, okay? The second thing that we saw in the, the, the vision, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple are promised. We're, we're not told in the vision how long after Messiah comes, the prince is going to come who destroys Jerusalem and the temple. But the promise is made that one is going to come who does that. Turn to Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus is right near the end. And he's approaching the city of Jerusalem. And as he looks down on the city, he begins to cry. Is he crying for himself? He's crying for the people of that city because he knows what is coming on them. And he knows why it's coming. The judgment that's coming. And listen, what he says in Luke 19, 
verses 43 and 44. He says, The days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave you with one stone upon another. And then he says the reason why. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Why was Jerusalem destroyed? Jesus says it is because they did not recognize the time of their visitation. They did not recognize the Messiah in their midst. The one prophesied. The one that if they had paid any attention to what God said in His Word, they would have known the exact year of His emergence. And when they saw John the Baptist in the wilderness immersing this guy in the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove and the sound from the heaven saying, this is my son. And they saw him performing all these wonderful miracles and speaking the truth of God and fulfilling prophecy after prophecy. If they had only said, you are the Messiah, we will worship you, then Jerusalem wouldn't have been destroyed. Now, God knew all along that they would what? They would not recognize him as Messiah. But whose fault is it they didn't recognize him as Messiah? Theirs. And for that reason, when Jesus is crucified, God says, you are guilty and you are condemned to be destroyed in sin. Now the judgment didn't come for another 40 years. In the year 70 AD, Rome comes under, uh, 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 under the command of General Titus. They come and they destroy Rome, uh, uh, Jerusalem. There are factions within the war uh, and within the city fighting one another. People are starving to death. Uh, the, the city falls. There's a slaughter. The temple is ripped apart. As Daniel said, it would happen. And Jesus said it would happen in the New Testament. And in Daniel's vision, he's told that the one who destroys Jerusalem with himself, the Destroyed. General Titus will go on to become Emperor Titus, and at the age of 41, a guy who is loved by the Romans, he catches a fever and dies. God strikes him dead. We come to the end of the vision. I want to share just a handful of truths with you to kind of try to help you hang on to something. First of all, God is in control of history. There is no doubt. There is no ruler who comes to power unless God allows it. And, and as hard as that is for me to, to sometimes wrap my brain around, we don't have a president unless God allows him to be president. We don't have a, a, a people in charge of our state, even, I don't think, unless God allows people, people God allows people to have sorrow. There, there is no event or virus or scheme that takes him by surprise. It's not like we're rolling along and coronavirus comes along and God says, whoa, I didn't see that coming. No, he, he's not taken by surprise. He knows everything that is going to happen all the way out to the end. And he is in control and he is working his plan in spite of the devil, in spite of the schemes of men. And sometimes God uses them while they think they're using him. The second truth, the Jewish people as a whole are no longer the people of God. Now some people will hear that and they say, oh no, you can't say that. Because there are a lot of preachers out there who are going to tell you <clears throat> they've got this whole big grand scheme that at the end of time Jesus is going to return and he's going to rebuild, you know, Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt and all the Jewish people are going to come to Jesus. There's going to be this great revival and every Jewish person is going to be saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's simply not. This vision we have read reveals the completion of God's covenant with the Jews. That covenant was fulfilled and fully realized in the coming of Jesus. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 7, Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. The sons of Abraham are the people of God, right? And 
up until Jesus, everybody that was physically a Jewish person, we're descendants of Abraham. Well, what we find in the New Testament under the New Covenant is it doesn't matter who your daddy was. That doesn't mean you're saved. And I'm going to tell you right now, you might have grew up in a Christian home. That doesn't mean you're saved. You have to accept Jesus. And every Jewish person has the same choice to make as I have to make as a Gentile. They either accept Messiah or reject him. And if anybody rejects Messiah, they are not a child of Abraham. Because they don't have the faith of Abraham to believe in God when God says so. And to obey God. But any Jewish person who will come to Messiah, come to Jesus, then they are indeed children of Abraham. Not because of the blood in their veins, but because they have the faith of Abraham. The third truth. The Bible is the accurate and authoritative word of God. Skeptics have been saying for years, the book of Daniel, you know, it's got all these visions that talk about the rise of Persia and Greece and Rome, and that couldn't have been written as old as it was because that would have meant they were predicting the future. So it must have been written after Rome came into power. The problem is there's not a person, a critic, a, a serious critic of the book of Daniel who would say it was written after the birth of Jesus. So even if, if these people were there not, even if they were right that it wasn't until after Rome began that Daniel was written, they still can't explain how the Messiah prophecy that we've read came true. In 539, Daniel recorded a vision that began to be fulfilled in 457, 82 years later. And anybody who looks at that from then on could count on their fingers and toes and find out that in the year uh, that 569 years in the future would all come to pass. The final truth I want to share with you is this. The importance of knowing Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. I want to circle back to one point. What happened at the end of that seven year period? Jesus is baptized. Three and a half years later he dies. That covenant goes on for three and a half more years and then something changes because the end of that whole long period of time that God's dealing with the Jewish people and their sin issue, that comes to an end. What changes? It seems that there was this man named Saul three and a half years after Jesus' death. And Saul's walking down a road to a town called Damascus and he's got a plan. He's going to kill the Christians there, because he's a good, strong Jewish man who, who doesn't believe this gospel that's being preached. Jesus appears to him and blinds him so that he can't even see, and he says, you go on into town, and, and I've got a plan for you. And so, so Saul goes into town to, back to Damascus, and Jesus speaks to Ananias, a Christian in that town, and he says in Acts 9, verse 15, to Ananias, Jesus says, go, go to Saul. Ananias didn't want to go. He says, go, for he, Saul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Before that moment, the vast majority of Christians, believers, were Jewish. The focus of the preaching of the gospel was to the Jewish people. Now yes, Peter preached to Gentiles as well and converted uh, uh, Cornelius and his household, but the majority were Jewish. But at this point, Jesus says, that man right there, his first priority is going to be to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the rest of the world. Not just to the Jewish people, but to everybody. Do you get it now? The 490 years, gee, God dealt with all of the sin issue of Israel. The old covenant came to an end, and then the new covenant has begun, and it's been expanded beyond the Jewish people to everybody. See, the old covenant is replaced by the new covenant. It actually was replaced officially with the death of Jesus and his resurrection, but at this moment, it is proclaimed not only to the Jewish people, but to everybody. That is the key thing that happened 
at the end of that final seven years. And the new covenant is a covenant of grace. This covenant is to recognize Jesus as your Savior and your Lord and to come to Him for forgiveness and to receive that righteousness from God. A covenant open to everybody, Jew and Gentile, and it is open to you today. Folks, nothing can stop God's plan for this world. Nothing. And nothing can stop His plan for our salvation. But just like everybody else in this world, and everybody else in this world that has had their sins forgiven and received that righteousness from God, you have to come to Jesus. You have to confess Him as your Lord and your Savior. You have to be baptized in His name and be forgiven for your sins. Receive the gift of His own life. Have you done that? You need to do it today if you haven't. If you're at home right now and you haven't done that, you need to do it today. You need to do it today. What do you need to do with this message? I think you need to be encouraged, because I sure am. I think you need to be amazed, because I sure am. And I think you need to tell somebody else about it that doesn't know, because I sure am. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we look at your word today, we are amazed. You lay it all out there. It is a wonderful thing to see the validation of your word yet again so clearly you have showed us that, that there's nothing and no one that can stop your plan going forward. As we look at the world around us, as we look at our life right now, our families, our community, our country, it seems like there are a lot of things swirling out of control. It seems like the enemy's winning in different ways. But Lord, we know that you have already decreed everything that's going to happen. It all fits to your plan. And you will not be stopped. We look forward with excitement to what's coming because we know that it's part of your plan. Help us to leave this place today. Help us to go from our homes this week and share with others the truth that we hear in your word. Share the gospel so that all would come to faith in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody say Amen. 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 Won't you come to be standing soon?